fiscal reform to benefit state and local governments. The Modern Money Theory Approach by L. Randall Ray Money Users State and Local Government and the Euro Members When the new Euro currency was introduced, MMT analyzed the member states as if they were U.S. states. Footnote 10 See Bell and Nell, 2003, for a collection of chapters outlining the problems with the European Monetary Union, EMU. And footnote. Each was given up each was given up its own currency to join a monetary union by adopting the euro. Similarly, the U.S. states had joined a monetary union based on the dollar, with each giving up its colonial currency. We analyze states as users of the currency rather than issuers. In the case of the United States, the issuer is the national government. The U.S. Constitution gave Congress the sole authority to issue the currency, and for much of U.S. history, that came under the Treasury's responsibility. The United States was a relative latecomer, as many other nations had long ago created central banks to handle state finances, and gradually their central bank notes came to be the predominant form of currency. After the Federal Reserve's creation, its notes, too, eventually replaced treasury notes and coins as the main currency. The treasury stopped issuing currency to make its payments. Coins are issued solely on demand in exchange for Federal Reserve liabilities, notes and reserves, so that they are not spent into existence. Instead, all treasury spending and receipts pass through the Fed, which makes or receives all payments from and to their treasury. As discussed above, most of these payments take the form of credits to bank reserves, bank deposits held at the Fed, which are perfectly substitutable to Fed notes or Treasury coins. Effectively, most currency now takes the form of reserves. In the case of the Euro area, the European Central Bank, ECB, is the issuer of the currency. Member states are users. Footnote 11. Euro notes and coins are issued by member nations. However, the ECB controls the quantities each is allowed to issue. The members retain the seniorage for minting coins, which is not a very significant source of finance. End footnote. Here, however, the distinction is not so clear-cut, as each member nation is still has a treasury and a central bank. These central banks make and receive payments for their treasuries. However, neither the member's central bank nor the ECB is supposed to directly lend to, that is, purchase debt from, the treasuries. Still, central banks may purchase government bonds in secondary markets, and after the global financial crisis, the ECB also did so, which effectively provides an end run around the prohibition just as it does in the United States. When they do so, they create central bank reserves denominated in the euro. As in the case of the United States, these reserves can be exchanged into euro notes and coins on demand. If all payments were to re remain within the borders of a member nation, there would be no constraint on the, member on the member central bank's ability to create euros, purchasing government bonds in secondary markets. By contrast, in the United States, state and local government debts are not bought by the central bank. Footnote 12. Given that the Fed bought private, troubled assets and provided the funding for others to do so, it might be able to buy, or at least encourage purchases of, troubled state and local government debt. In 1966, banks tried to unload municipal bonds Creating a, fund, creating a funding problem for local governments. The Fed intervened, sending a letter to member banks announcing it would open the discount window to banks that would help stabilize markets, relieving the pressure, showing the Fed does not have to ignore local government finance. See Minsky, 1986. However, the Fed did not rescue the state of New York, 
Orange County in California, or any number of other state and local governments in their financial crises, and it is not likely to do so in the future. This is the difference between operating as a lender of last resort when there is a liquidity problem versus providing finance to a government facing fiscal problems. End footnote. A complication arises, however, because euro deposits created within Italy can be transferred to Germany through both current account deficits and as well capital flows. This then leads to a clearing drain with a debit against an Italian account and a credit toward a German account. The Target 2 system was created to handle the clearing. The main exporting nations, including above all Germany, accumulate large net credits while the importing nations, Spain, Italy, Greece, accumulate large net debits in the Target 2 accounts. Persistent net flows also occur within the United States. However, U.S. states do not have their own central banks, so the clearing takes place between Federal Reserve district banks. No one really knows or cares which U.S. state runs chronic current account imbalances. But in the case of the Eurozone, it is easy to identify the current account deficit nations and to link those to the net debits in the Target 2 system and to risk exposures. If, for example, a large net debtor were to default, which could happen on an exit, the net creditors, Germany, is by far the largest, could face losses. In the United States, it is rather difficult to identify which are the chronic current account deficit states, and the issue of exit of a U.S. state was already resolved in the negative in the Civil War. The jury is still out on an exit from the EMU. In the United States, the risk is not due to current account imbalances or to danger of an exit, but rather to excessive debt issued by state and local governments, and there is a real risk of default by highly indebted governments. There are also differences among Euro nations regarding how much debt governments have issued relative to national GDP. If everyone believed that all members are equally creditworthy, this wouldn't create systemic problems. However, if some are seen as riskier, then they can face lower credit scores and higher interest rates on government debt. Further, when perceived risk rises, capital flows out of the nation lead to rising target to debits. Wealth holders can easily distinguish between German debt, national and local government debt, as well as bank debt, and Greek debt and can run to the safety of the German government and German bank debt. In the United States, no one cares where a bank might be headquartered, and while there can be a run out of Orange County debt, there is no reason to shun all debt issued by California-based borrowers. In the United States, virtually all states are required to balance their budgets, at least on their current accounts. They are, however, permitted to borrow for capital projects. Like the Euro nations, they vary in their perceived creditworthiness and private credit rating agencies provide ratings for state and local government debt. States rarely approve budgets that are not balanced, and when their debt is downgraded, they react quickly by cutting spending. There is a large divergence between the debt-to-GDP ratios of Eurozone nations and U.S. states, with state government debts measured relative to state JD GDP. Some Eurozone nations have debt ratios of 100% or higher, while U.S. states typically have ratios well below 20% less than a third of what the Maastricht criteria allow. Again, U.S. states must submit balanced budgets, although ex post budgets can be in register deficit, especially in recessions that usually lead to strong pressure to reduce spending and raise taxes. So state borrowing is typically earmarked to specific projects, such as sports stadiums. Eurozone nations, on the other hand, budget for deficits, 
and are permitted to do so by Maastricht criteria, which allow deficits of 3% of GDP and most have exceeded this ratio at one time or another. In sum, in many respects, Eurozone members enjoy advantages in comparison to U.S. states in that they have greater fiscal policy space, which allows them to plan for deficit spending and to issue debt up to ratios that far exceed what U.S. states are permitted. On the other hand, U.S. states have one huge potential advantage. The U.S. federal government's share of GDP is over a fifth, and its deficit is typically around 5% of G GDP. Mandatory spending is about two-thirds, and most of that is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. This is spread among the U.S. states and population in a somewhat progressive manner, while federal taxes are also progressive. That means that net federal spending by state and region tends to flow to lower-income populations. Further, with a budget deficit, the federal government is a net source of income to households and firms around the country. Finally, federal government net spending moves counter-cyclically because social spending rises in recessions while tax revenues fall, and discretionary spending also tends to be targeted to lower-income states and regions. All of this means that there is redistribution that favors states with lower income and less favorable economic outcomes. By contrast, the Eurozone's central fiscal authority is the European Parliament, whose budget is less than 1% of the Eurozone's GDP. Further, that budget is contributed by members, so it is not net spending. While it is distributed on a progressive basis, with low-income member states receiving relatively larger shares, it is a small drop in the bucket. U.S. transfers are relatively larger and are not constrained by revenues, as the federal government can and does run large deficits. The difference between the U.S. system and the Euro system are quite obvious in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, as U.S. budget deficits grew to a trillion dollars. Uncle Sam bore much of the burden of ramped up social spending, food stamps, unemployment compensation. Fiscal stimulus, although limited to two years, it totaled $800 billion. And bailouts of the financial system, the Fed spent and lent $29 trillion through its alphabet soup of facilities, on top of the Treasury's $800 billion of spending on Wall Street. In the Eurozone, however, most of the responsibility in all of these areas fell to the member nations, whose revenues plummeted in their time of need. The Eurozone budget deficits that resulted were met with market reactions. The more indebted nations faced higher in high interest rate spreads, and any help from the ECB or international financial organizations came with strings attached that typically required austerity. It is not surprising that recovery was more difficult in the Euro area. Still, the U.S. federal government's response was far less than what was needed, which is why the recovery from the global financial crisis was slower than any other post-war recovery. And generally speaking, each subsequent downturn and recovery after the early 1970s has been weaker so the underlying problem was not unique to the global financial crisis, but has been apparent for a long time. We next turn to the post-war transition of thinking about fiscal constraints of the national government and how that has impacted state and local governments, as well as overall economic performance.